We find that now 85% of clinical trials are commercially funded. 97% of the most frequently cited articles uh, are commercially funded. Compared to non-industry-sponsored studies, industry-sponsored studies are significantly more favorable. They show fewer harms and their overall conclusions are more positive. And the majority of uh, physicians CME, continuing medical education is funded by industry. And even 59% of the authors of expert guidelines have financial ties to interested manufacturers. So now we're seeing this commercial shift in uh, the, the core purpose of medical research. And importantly, 96% of medical research in the United States is about drugs and devices, 96%. So when doctors are doing what we want our doctors to do to read the medical journals, to stay up on the latest knowledge that's being produced by researchers, 96% of that information is about new drugs and devices. And that leaves only 4% and only a fraction of that, about 2%, addresses how to help Americans be healthier. So this is how we, this is the key, the, the linchpin of the tail wags dog phenomenon, where the drug companies and other commercial interests are funding 96% of the research. So 96% of the knowledge that even our best doctors have access to is designed and carried out for the purpose of maximizing the shift of money from working Americans to the investors in the drugs, drug companies, and, and other uh, medical device companies and other medical industries. This is how it's happened. So without any abrupt shift, now 96% of what good doctors know, what evidence-based medicine says is about new drugs and devices, not about healthy lifestyle and so forth. And uh, I'm gonna show a slide at the end, but about 20% or a maximum of 20% of our health is determined by our medical care and 80% by how we live our lives. So we've got this enormous mismatch between what is being produced as the most, uh, the latest and most important and innovative medical knowledge is 96% about drugs and devices, where healthcare in toto is responsible for only about 20% of our health. And people are misdirected <clears throat> into thinking that if they want to do the best for their health, they'll make sure they're getting the most innovative new drugs and devices, but they're not motivated to really go put their energy in where the health really is, which is not so innovative. It's not so innovative, but it is effective and 80% of our health. So as I go on, I'm going to make you more skeptical about the drug industry and just keep saying to yourself, you can take charge of 80% of the determinants of your health. It, the ball's in your side of the court and you can be smart. And that's what most of the other speakers are talking about in the conference. What I wanna show you is that not to be, I, I wanna uh, teach you how to defend yourselves against the glitter of innovation and stick to what really um, will help us improve our health and healthcare. <clears throat> So now, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanna show um, this wonderful study. <clears throat> One sec. This wonderful study was published in the New England Journal in 2005. <clears throat> and remember only 26% of the uh, commercially sponsored research was being done uh, in academic medical centers at that point. This is a study that looked at the terms of the contracts for that 26% of research that goes on in academic medical centers, the terms of the contracts between the academic medical centers and the <clears throat> study sponsors. 
And it shows the extreme bias, the extreme commercialism that the academic medical centers have to agree to, to maintain their 26% of the research. So let's look at where the circles are. So the, uh, the contracts were, the, the contracting officers were queried. <clears throat> In your best judgment, would your office, your research office at an academic medical center, allow a clause in a multi-center clinical trial agreement that said the sponsor will own the data produced by the research? So the academic medical centers are doing the research, they're putting their name on the research, and 80% of these contracts allow the sponsor, the commercial sponsor of the research to own the data, not the academic medical center. And that matters. That matters because 24% of the contracts say the sponsor can put its own statistical analyses in the manuscripts that are submitted for publication. <clears throat> They're not saying in conjunction with the authors, the academic authors. They're not saying anything about the academic authors. They're saying the, the, the commercial sponsor can include its own statistical analyses in the manuscripts. And then this one is just, it boggles my mind every time I present this. The sponsor will write up, would you, they're asking the academic medical center contracting people if they would agree to let the sponsor write up the results of the clinical trial for publication and the investigators, meaning the academic non-drug company employed investigators, may review the manuscript and suggest revisions, but not insist upon revisions. And the only recourse that the academic investigators have if their revisions are turned down and they feel it's essential is to resign from the project and not get paid for their work. So what this says in plain English is that half of the contracts, research contracts, that academic medical centers um, sign with commercial sponsors allows the academic, uh, excuse me, allows the commercial sponsors to ghostwrite the article. And the academic authors on the article have no recourse. This is, I, I hope I'm making the point that this is beyond the pale of what we think of as the role of universities and academic medical centers to develop knowledge in the public interest. And what this shows is the extent to which this knowledge is being produced for the private interest. <clears throat> this is a slide, I've done a lot of litigation, I've testified in front of juries, in front of judges, in front of the FBI and the Department of Justice. Um, this slide, I'm going to show you some slides that came out of litigation I participated in. <clears throat> this slide came out of different litigation. It's from Pfizer. And this just tells it the way it is. Uh, jaw dropping. Hold on to your bottom of your jaw because it's going to drop out. Data ownership and transfer. Pfizer sponsored studies belong to Pfizer, not to any individual. The purpose of data is to support directly or indirectly marketing of our product. Purpose of our data is not to help people be healthy, the primary purpose, not to improve health, not to improve population health in the United States, not to, develop, to, to deliver therapies that are more efficient. No, the purpose of Pfizer's data is to support directly or indirectly marketing of our product. And therefore, down here, therefore, commercial marketing uh, and medical um, uh, corporate employees need to be involved in all data dissemination efforts. Can't say it any clearer. Their research is designed to make money. Sometimes it makes health, but it's designed to fundamentally make money. Mm -hmm.